Welcome, everybody. It is an absolute pleasure to see you today with um, virtual um, and emotional intelligence. Your host today is Brianna Tipping, and she's going to be introducing you to our great panelists. Please take it away, Brianna. Hi, everyone. Um, so you had a bit of networking, and if you guys weren't able to wrap up any of your conversations or just wanted to keep talking, we definitely have some time after. Um, it shouldn't take should take probably about twenty to twenty five minutes. Um, so let's meet our panelists. Um, Michael Reddington is here. He's just having some microphone issues, so he may trickle in uh, mid presentation. But I'll give him a little introduction just so you can understand who he is. Um, and he will be hopefully at some of the tables after so you guys can ask some questions or at least get his contact information. But Michael Reddington is a CFI. He is a president of Inquisitive Inc. Um, and a CFI is a certified forensic investigator. He created a disciplined listening method to have better conversations. And then we also have Brittany Nicole Connor Savarda. She is the founder of Catalyst for Change and the author of the EQ Deficiency. She is certified as a neurolinguistic pro program practitioner, sorry, and is commonly known as a people whisperer. So Brittany, if you don't mind turning on your camera, do you mind starting us off and introducing your business a little bit more? Hopefully. My mic was not going to open up either, but here I am. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, sure. So I found a Catalyst for Change about three years ago, and it all started with a personal journey and seeing how emotional intelligence really just did a 180 in my life. And at the time, I didn't know that emotional intelligence existed. I was just practicing something that I later found was emotional intelligence, which is self-awareness and regulation. And after I graduated college, got into the corporate world, I started to see all of the problems that I myself had been facing present themselves in leadership. And I viewed leaders as being completely different than, you know, a terrible person or a bad leader. I just saw people that did not know how to uh, manage their emotions and how their emotions were affecting how they operated and engaged with other people. And I saw this big need to teach people what I myself learned and that really changed every facet of my life. And that's how I founded Catalyst for Change. Yeah, that's awesome. I find a lot of people say that um, B to C, so when you're just selling, you know, retail or whatnot, it's a lot of emotional, but, and then they say B to B is more logical, but it's, it's a lot of emotional comes into. It's all B2B. emotion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 100%. It's important when you're talking to people. Yeah. Um, it looks like Michael's still still trying to troubleshoot some things. So we'll just get started with the rest of the conversation here. Um, so just a general question is, how do you think sales can change, whether it's good or bad, when emotional intelligence is involved? So it can go in either direction, right? Yeah. The thing mm -hmm. that I don't like to talk about with emotional intelligence, but is sadly a component of emotional intelligence, is the dark side of EQ. And that is people seeing how well it works to build that rapport with others and to understand body language and social cues. Mm -hmm. And so they take that information and then just apply it at a very surface level in order to manipulate other people. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing a lot of that today is that implement these things that I know work but mm -hmm. it's just the logic of it. There's not a lot of emotion involved in that. And so I think mm -hmm. when we really apply emotional intelligence at a core level, we can really start to build those genuine connections with our prospects or our clients. And that will really help us grow in our organization and within cells. But they look almost identical. And it's not until you really start to have that conversation with that person that they start to realize what side of the fence you're playing on. Mm -hmm. And it's creating skepticism in the marketplace and making it even more challenging for those people who are being genuine and emotionally intelligent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, just, it's almost like one of those things that in the right hands, you can it can be an amazing, amazing yeah. tool, but in the wrong hands, it can it can be quite an unfortunate scenario, right? Yeah, yeah. as with anything, right? It's all about mm -hmm. how it's used. All about how it's used. But yeah, once leveraged, it can be such a power, 
powerful tool, whether it's an internal or external. Mm -hmm. Um, So do you think that the virtual component in sales today has impacted that salesperson's ability to apply emotional intelligence and build relationships? That's a really tough question. I was thinking about that because, you know, with emotional intelligence, it's kind of like, and I don't want to say you have it or you don't, right? Yeah. Because there's, it's, it's a broad spectrum, but I think wherever you are currently in engaging with people, it can carry over virtually. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're extremely extroverted and you really gain your energy from that one-on-one contact with people, I think it can alter how well you you present yourself and how you can build that rapport with someone. But I think it's to each their own. You know, it, it really depends on the person. Some people, it makes them feel more comfortable because they have a little bit of that barrier and they don't have all of that anxiety that comes with actually meeting someone physically. I think people assume that all salespeople are extroverted, but that's not always the case. Right. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting having that discussion with uh, introverted versus extrovert, because I find that with this whole transition to working from home, introverts are definitely like winning in this. Yeah. Area, right. Like they don't yeah. have to go um, to all those places, have all of that small talk. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm I'm actually quite introverted myself and I find it harder to have those conversations because you can't you know, you can only see my chest and up here. You can't see my full body language and how I'm engaging. And so I find taking away that component can be quite difficult, at least when you're having conversations. Um, so it's interesting to see, you know, extroverted, they do feed off of being over through people. But as an introvert, I like to rely on more than just speech. Um, yeah. To- and I, I think what's challenging with the virtual component, whether it's sales or any form of communication or engagement, yeah is that people don't have to have their cameras on. You Mm -hmm. can't force someone. And that's where I find the struggle is when they're like, you know, I'm I'm just not uh, feeling comfortable with showing myself right now. And so you have zero cues to rely on, Mm -hmm. except for the tone in their voice. But then when you have that silence, you don't know if they're thinking because you can't see their facial expressions. Right. You don't know if they're like having some issues, if they're on mute. You just you, you just don't know these things. And that can lead to some anxiousness within yourself, which mm-hmm. then can influence your continued interactions and how you're going to speak to that person going forward. Right. Yeah. So as it, uh, nerves kick in. It changes things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. With, like, you know, the Zoom burnout and the fact that people are just so sick of seeing themselves all the time. Um, yeah, it really changes the dynamic of conversations um, and definitely brings some anxiousness to the table in terms of the salesperson's perspective. Yeah, that's a very interesting topic. But um, one thing, sorry, I'm going to just expand no, on this no, just no. a little bit. You're talking about people seeing themselves. And I think that can also go in both directions, because one thing that I've noticed is I pay more attention to how I'm coming across. You can't see yourself when you're talking to someone in person. You don't Mm -hmm. know how your face looks to them. And I've actually picked up on like the RBF, right? Like, you know, (laughs) how am I looking at people? Do I come across as being interested when I'm actually interested? Does it really show that way? So again, I think there's just, it's so complex, but you brought up some really good points. Yeah, it's also very interesting. Um, One um, makes me think of this, but say I used to work, you know, in high school, I worked at Subway and they, and there was one topic that some of my coworkers discussed that if you put a mirror behind the employees at Subways, people are less likely to to act out against employees and be mean to retail workers because we see them doing doing yeah. these you know, mean acts and then that holds them more accountable to their actions. And so, it works with kids too. <laughs> if you have a kid with a tantrum, give them a mirror and they don't like yeah. to see it. They're like, they like to see okay. it. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. So maybe, yeah, you may even have some people holding back too when you're doing this because they don't want to see themselves. Exactly, exactly. You know, it's so complex. It. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting, the, the seeing yourself too. Yeah. So how do you think creating rapport in the sales process has changed with the switch to online, if it has at all? Um, you know, 
I'm not quite sure if it has. I'm, I'm sure it has. And, and again, there's so many nuances yes. to this. So if I say that it has changed, I'm basing that off of my experience, my perception. Of course. I feel like with the virtual space, um, it's easier to reach out to people. But the problem is anytime there's this low barrier to entry, if you will, um, I don't know if I phrase that the right way, but the easier it is to do anything, the more people are going to try to do it. And right. so I think it's made things very difficult for people whose profession is in sales because now they have more competition, whereas some people would go out and meet prospects and build those relationships Right. But now they can't do that. Mm -hmm. So now they're with all these other people who are just messaging, 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 or using bots, right? Yeah. To message, yeah. message, message. And how do you differentiate that? And are people just deleting your emails or your messages without even looking into it? Yeah. So I think it's yeah. definitely complicated things and it's made it more difficult to find those right people because they're yeah. just burnt out. Of course. I, I just have a question for the audience here. Has anyone found that they've been getting a lot of more um, people sliding into your LinkedIn DMs or, or more people reaching out to you um, that way, trying to build that report with you? Um, I know that some some people I know, they yeah, they've just seen an influx of people just messaging them. Um, and it gets a little bit overwhelming sometimes. But yeah, it is it it's kind of like a spray and spray and hope that hope that you can build that rapport, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A lot more is done online. Oh terrible messages too. That's funny. I can just imagine some of the stuff. It's almost turning into a, a Tinder with a with a bad pickup line, right? Trying to, trying to get people open your message at, at some points. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know you made a really good point that, you know, it, it has changed or it may, may, may or may not have changed. And I think one thing that really stuck with me is, yeah, there's a lot of people doing it and then a lot of people getting burnt out. Yeah. Um, yeah, one example is we used to, pre-COVID, we used to run some webinars, um, but almost everyone is running some webinars nowadays that is just getting so saturated too. And um, and so it's really hard to actually even market because there's a lot of people doing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Same yeah. with coaching. I feel like yeah. everybody's becoming a coach. And yeah. I spent 15 months going through my certification to get a coach and my degrees in psychology. Yeah. And then I know people who haven't done anything and just call themselves a coach and mm -hmm. I'm not saying that some of them aren't great at what they do, but again, whenever it's super easy to get into a field, there's going to be a ton of people that are getting in there. And then mm -hmm. you've got all of these competitors yeah. and you don't know how to size them up. It's not like, you know, a PhD master's doctorate where you can differentiate the level of study right. someone's had, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's in the same playing field by their title. Yeah. So yeah. No, it's, yeah, there's a lot of coaches too that I've I've seen. Those are some of the people that are definitely reaching out. Yeah. Um, yeah. so how can you change the new quote unquote, because it's been a year, um, virtual process and apply emotional intelligence better? So how how can people change the process right now to better apply emotional intelligence? Yeah, um, I would say be authentic and genuine, but I feel like that is so overused, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I think we've really lost connection with what it means to be authentic. And right. instead, we've attached ourselves to what we believe authenticity should be and what people want to see. And I see that with messaging so much these days in the virtual world where on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. so I say, you know, I love what you're doing. It's so needed. I support that. I would really love to get to know how you got started and more about your business. And they're trying to build that rapport, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to build that connection, but they have a motive behind it. Right. And mm -hmm. again, that is making people skeptical because at mm -hmm. first, when it happens just a couple of times, you're like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. This person's interested in me. And within 10 minutes of the conversation, 
they're trying to sell you something or, well, let me tell you what I, how, what I do applies to you. And I think we need to slow down. We're in a world where we expect instant gratification and things to happen quickly. And I think we need to take a step back and go back to actually building those relationships with people because mm-hmm. I'm here today because I built a relationship with someone who exactly. connected me with someone who asked me to come here, right? That connected mm-hmm. me with Matt. Yeah. And there was no motive to it. I saw a post that they did. I jumped in a conversation. I was like, can we talk about this? I want to nerd out with you on this conversation. Yeah. And we did and we stay connected. But there was no talk about my business and how I could help that person. But people, if they like you, then they'll connect you with the right people who are looking for your services and what you offer. So if we learn anything from this virtual space is take advantage of the opportunity to make genuine connections with people all over the world. We've never had that opportunity before Mm -hmm. and stop trying to get in so quickly. That that would be my advice to people is really build that relationship. Don't, don't try to, do that whole facade of rapport building because yeah, people are tired of it. Absolutely. I love that. And I think you're getting a lot of claps from the audience too, because it, it is true. And I think this is not just in B2B. This is in your whole life. Yeah. It's yes. the instant gratification that you need to, to say hi and then jump on your ask. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's just worth um, building that, conversation, building that relationship and just fostering something because yeah, when I'm uh, just getting out of university and like I, you can go to these networking events that you talk to someone for five minutes that you're never going to talk to again, or I can talk to somebody and pick their brain and, you know, like you said, nerd out about a topic and some people just love to nerd out about a topic. Right. So sometimes best thing you can do to actually build really worthwhile relationships that will actually help you in the long run. It's a long, Mm -hmm. it's a long-term game. It's not just a short-term play, right? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. That answered my next question of what piece of advice would you, would you add? Um, That was absolutely great. I think we're just going to tie that up there. It's been about, yeah, it's been about 20 minutes. So maybe we'll go back and if uh, Michael's microphone is working, hopefully be at the table. I had a conversation with him yesterday. It was amazing. He has so much to offer. So hopefully it starts working. Yeah. So my one last question is if people want to find you or talk to you a little bit more, um, where could they, where could they, could they do so? LinkedIn is my hangout spot. So that's Mm -hmm. definitely the best way. I think I put that in my profile as well. And um, also a lot of what I speak about is in my book the EQ deficiency. So if you really want to get to know how I think and how to apply all of this stuff, uh, I would say that's a really good resource too. Awesome. Thank you so much. Great. And if any of you guys missed it or came in halfway, we will be posting this recording into that LinkedIn event. So just keep on tabs on there if you ever missed any of it, or if you want to share this, this panel with any of your friends. All right. Awesome. Thank you all.